Oh, hello everyone. Hello. Um, your mic's muted at the moment. Looks to me like the live Hello everyone, hopefully you can all hear me now. Um Welcome to tonight's UQCS talk. Today we have David Lord here at DAL on Slack, and today he's going to be doing a talk about um, malware versus nuclear centrifuges uh, and the backstory behind Stuxnet. Take it away. Hi folks, uh, can everyone hear me? Can you just drop a message in chat if you can, please? Might check, might check, one, two, three. Not so sure about that, hey. It looks fine. Okay. So I am on camera right now, then I'm surprised. Message in chat if you uh, can, please. There we go. It's a few seconds behind. Might check, might check, one, two, three. Okay, cool. Well, in that case, I'll um, go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. My name's David and Dal on Slack. You might have seen me in the yelling channel. I'm one of UQCS's longer running members. These days I work for OSCERT, which is one of UQ's cybersecurity groups. This talk was originally given to the Australian Information Security Association last year, but I've tweaked it a little since then for UQCS. Lovely, you can hear me. Okay, well, in that case, let's get underway. Um, this talk today is going to be about Stuxnet. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it was a worm embedding a rootkit for SCADA systems. Um, became extremely relevant in 2010 when Iran came out and said that their nuclear program, their centrifuges, had been attacked by this worm. Um, it was pretty big news at the time, uh, but um, I'm guessing not everyone in here would have been paying attention to information security back in 10 years ago, so here we are now. Uh, the suspected target for the worm was the centrifuges in the Natanz nuclear facility in Iran. Um, and it reportedly disabled about 1,000 out of 5,000 they had there. Um, the reason that it's so notable is not necessarily the targets that it affected, but the fact that it was one of the first major um, malware attacks at a nation state level. Um, this particular virus used four zero days in Windows, Microsoft Windows. Now, I'm just going to, um, if you're already familiar with zero days and with vulnerabilities, then you might want to skip over this bit. But uh, for everyone else, a zero day is, um, sorry, Matt, which is showing right now? Is it slides or is it the camera? Okay, cool. Uh, can we go back to the slides, please? Awesome, thank you. So the thing about a zero day is it's called that because it is a vulnerability, a security vulnerability in a piece of software which has been known about for zero days. Once the vendor, in this case Microsoft, becomes aware of it, then they can start to dissect it and find a patch for it and issue that patch. But a vulnerability is called a zero day when that hasn't happened yet. You know, the vulnerability exists on systems in the wild and um, it is available for exploit. Now, zero days can be quite valuable, uh, especially if they affect big products like Microsoft Windows, which is one of the most widely deployed pieces of software. Um, so that makes them special and interesting. And of course, Microsoft have a major interest in finding these and patching them as soon as possible. The fact that Stuxnet chained together not 
not just one, but four zero days in Windows meant that whoever was behind it was extremely resourced. You know, it, in order to discover or to purchase these vulnerabilities, um, they were quite capable. The other thing about a zero is once you use it, it it's burned. Um, that's what they call it. Because as soon as you deploy your software into the wild and it, um, it does its job, and then someone detects it, and they look into it and they take that back to Microsoft in this case and say, hey, what is this? What's going on? And Microsoft will dig into it and discover a patch and deploy the patch. So once you use a zero day, um, it is fairly quickly no longer useful. And that's why it's called burning. So for Stuxnet to have burned four zero days in Windows, each of which might have been worth 100 grand or more, um, whoever did this was not only very capable, but also very motivated. So as to who that was, um, it's widely attributed to the US and Israel, to the point that the Wikipedia page says this, but um, no one's ever actually come out and confirmed or denied that officially. Fair warning, you might have seen malware and OSSET on the promos and thought, we're going to fire up a sandbox and dissect some binaries, you know, dig into Stuxnet. Well, um, we're not. I do security all day. I don't want to do it after five. I have a science degree. Instead, we'll be covering some science and engineering. So at the time, everyone was talking about the Stuxnet thing attacking around centrifuges, but it wasn't often discussed what a centrifuge actually is or why it mattered. That's what we're looking at today. So what are they for? Well, it turns out that they're a critical part of producing nuclear materials. And um, that acronym before that, uh, when the slides weren't showing, a worm slash rootkit for SCADA systems at the top. I'll just expand that. I can never remember what SCADA stands for. It is Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Um, basically, in industrial control systems. You know, how you influence machines, um, swipe cards in buildings, um, machines in dams, power plants, centrifuge facilities, all that kind of thing. That's what it stands for. And that was the particular target for Stuxnet. So, that's the malware component. Um, let's look at the nuclear materials. So, what is the big deal with all this nuclear stuff? Why is it worth creating malware to target it? Well, nuclear technology is useful for two main things. Electricity and weapons. Nuclear electricity generation is part of the grid in many countries, including the US, Canada, France, Russia and China. Australia doesn't consume any uranium, uh, any nuclear energy ourselves, but we are the third, third largest producer of uranium in the world. So that's the electricity part. Now uh, the other half. Well, the weapons are pretty spooky. This is the famous mushroom cloud caused when a nuclear explosion goes off. There have only been two times that nuclear weapons have been fired in anger that we know of. Both times they were bombs dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 as part of the efforts to end World War II. That, um, <clears throat> I, frankly, I feel a little bit lucky that we haven't seen one since. You know, lots of tests, but no more used in anger. Here's a map of Brisbane. That innocuous little red icon, you can see where this is going, is targeted directly at the centre of UQ campus in St Lucia. So what would happen if we took one of these weapons, say the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima in 1945, and did the same thing to Brisbane? Well, first of all, there would be a great big mushroom cloud, as we saw before, but then this would take effect. So that big outer ring, the grey ring, represents light damage to buildings, um, mostly shattered glass and windows. You know, if you're standing next, next to a window when the bomb goes off, then you'll be pelted with glass fragments. But that's kind of it, you know, it's not so bad. That orange ring on the inside represents a high chance of third degree burns. Now, I'm not going to dwell too much on that, um, but suffice to say, if you're within the orange ring, it's going to hurt and you are probably going to to pass away. The grey ring within that, outside the green, represents severe building damage. Um, most buildings left within that area would not still be standing. 
But that's 1945 technology. As members of the Computing Society, we know how far computers have come in the 65 years since 1945. How about weapons? This is a modern day W88 warhead, um, part of the US nuclear arsenal. Trident missiles are able to carry up to 12 of these at once, but fortunately they're, only, they're limited by nuclear treaties, so they can only carry eight, which is not a great relief. The effect of this kind of bomb would be to... F yeah, most of Brisbane wouldn't have any windows left, but also radiating out from St Lucia, all the way from Brookfield in the west through Mount Gravatt in the southeast, um, most people within that region would simply be dead. And if they were in the grey region within that, they would almost certainly be dead. And that's not to mention the fallout, the um, poisoning that would fill the river, flood downstream, the ash, all that jazz. Um, it's a very bad time. Countries get nervous when other countries can do this. And that most likely it was why Stuxnet was created, to impede Iran's nuclear program and reduce their capability in this field. So let's talk about centrifuges now, the target of Stuxnet. This is a hallway full of centrifuges. Um, each of those cylinders is one gas centrifuge. They're lined up in rows like that because they form parts of... Uh, centrifuges are arranged as cascades. The output from one becomes the input to the next. It's also worth noting these are gas centrifuges, and whenever I talk about centrifuges through this whole talk, I'll be meaning gas. Liquid centrifuges do exist, and they're used in um, medical labs and that sort of thing, separating blood from plasma. Today we're talking about gas centrifuges. This photo was taken in Iran, in the Natanz nuclear facility where Stuxnet took, uh, took effect. In 2010, they had about 5,000 centrifuges. Here's the whole supply chain we'll cover today. It looks pretty complicated, right? We'll go through these in more detail and revisit it at the end. The single big biggest thing to take away from the slide is, see that process at the top marked in rich? That's what Stuxnet went after. Everything else depends on it. Okay, so that is the overview. Now let's get into some high school physics. Now remember before that I, I said I have a science degree? It's computer science, so we can't go too deep here. This picture is the classic model of an acid. It's pretty inaccurate with modern understanding, but it's extremely useful as a teaching aid. The blue particles orbiting around the outside are electrons. Normally they're very important in chemistry, but for today's demonstration, um, they are pretty much irrelevant. We're talking about nuclear physics, which means we're focusing on the nucleus, the bit in the center. It's made up of two kinds of particles. Remember, this is a pretty simplified perspective. You know, we're not talking quarks and gluons. There are only two kinds of particles, uh, the gray neutrons and the red protons. Now, protons are particles which are electrically charged. They have a positive charge and if you think of taking two magnets, you know, two little bar magnets, and, and you take the north end on each and you try to hold them and push them together, what do they do? They push apart, they fight, they, they repel each other. And the same thing is true of protons um, in a nucleus. Because they're all positively charged, and they're constantly uh, repelling from each other. Neutrons, on the other hand, are electrically neutral. They're also very slightly heavier than protons. Um, for long, complicated reasons we don't want to go into, neutrons are related to what's called the strong nuclear force, which is a force that's powerful enough to overcome the repulsion between protons and bind the nucleus together and hold it together. <clears throat> the other thing to note now, and <clears throat> this will become useful, is that an element is defined by the number of protons in the nucleus. Uranium, for example, there are 92 protons in the nucleus of every atom that is uranium. That's why it's uranium. But you can have a variable number of neutrons. Um, if you have 92 protons and 143 neutrons, then it's uranium. But if you have 92 protons and 146 neutrons, not 43, then that is still uranium. But they're slightly different atoms. 
Um, the difference here, the variants, are called isotopes. Cool. So that's our nuclear physics. Now let's quickly cover chain reactions. Um, this is the exponential reaction that causes, um, uh, that makes nuclear technology useful, that lets you extract energy from atoms to turn it into electricity for powering your grid or into bombs. Up the top here, this blue element is, ooh, do I want to start drawing on this? No, I'm not going to take the risk. This blue atom is an atom of uranium-235, one of the isotopes, one of the lighter isotopes of uranium. It's just sitting there by itself. But if we bombard it with a nucleon, um, a small a, uh, neutron or proton, a nucleon, and we do it in the right way, then we can cause it to absorb the nucleon and then destabilize and split apart. When it splits apart, it releases energy, which will form part of our explosion or heating. But it also releases more nucleons traveling in different directions. And some of those, each of those will go into different places. The nucleon on the left has hit an atom of uranium-238, one of the heavier isotopes. And uranium-238 is capable of taking that and absorbing it, and it doesn't break apart. The nucleon on, on the right has gone off into empty space and it's hit nothing significant. But the nucleon down the center has hit another atom of uranium-235, which starts this again. It, um, the atom absorbs the nucleon, destabilizes, breaks apart, releases energy, and releases more particles. And those particles, if you've done this right, will hit other atoms of uranium and break them apart and release energy, and they'll release more nucleons and you get this runaway exponential reaction. Exponential, that's a word we're hearing a lot of recently. Cool, so let's talk about uranium. That's the worst of the physics out of the way, I promise. Uranium is at the heart of the nuclear industry. It's the heaviest element found in nature, which makes it unstable and radioactive. It's commonly depicted like this, green and glowing, upper left. It's actually a grey metal. It looks a bit like lead, but it's about 50% more dense than lead. There are a whole bunch of valid isotopes of uranium, but there are two that are the most interesting today. Remember, an isotope is an atom with a variable number of neutrons. Um, both of these atoms, both these isotopes have 92 protons, so they're uranium, but they have different numbers of neutrons, and that makes them subtly different. Uranium-235 on the left is what's called fissile. That is, it's kind of unstable. And if you strike it with a neutron right, then it will break apart and allow that chain reaction. It's sufficiently unstable for that. And that makes it useful immediately. Um, if you can get enough U-235 together in one place, then you can use that to generate fuel, uh, generate electricity as fuel or in weapons. The catch is it doesn't occur much in nature. It's only about 0.7% of all uranium in the world, which means if you have a kilogram of uranium, is it, ooh, 70 atoms or seven atoms? I've forgotten. <laughs> it's not my notes, but not very many of them will be the U-235 isotope. Most of the rest will be the one on the right, U-238, with three more neutrons. It's more stable which means that it's not fissile, it's not capable of sustaining that chain reaction. But it is useful because it can be turned into plutonium artificially. It forms about 99% of natural uranium. So, if U-235 is, is really useful and U-238 is not in this chain reaction, we need to find some way to increase the proportion of U-235 in a sample to make it useful. This is a little table of what, how much U-235 you need in a sample to be able to use it. It's called enrichment when you increase the proportion of U-235. So normally it occurs at about 0.7%. If you can increase that to 3% or 5%, then you can use that in a nuclear reactor to produce electricity. If you want to make a modern weapon, like the bigger bomb I showed you before, you need about 20% enriched uranium. That is 20% of the U-235 isotope, and most of the rest, 80% of the U-238. And you also need to add some plutonium. 
if you want an, to power a naval reactor, you know, the portable ones that they put in ships and possibly submarines, um, aircraft carriers, then you need to enrich it up to 50%. Classic weapons, uh, such as the bomb drop on Hiroshima, need between 40% and 80% enrichment to go off. The Hiroshima bomb specifically used 80% and 64 kilograms off. So from this perspective, U-235 is useful and U-238 is effectively a contaminant. To make um, a sample of uranium useful, we need to increase the proportion of U-235 and that process is called enrichment. That's uranium. Let's talk about plutonium. Plutonium is even better than uranium, both for energy and for weapons. Uh, weapons made with plutonium can have 40 to 500 times the yield of uranium. It's cheaper to produce than heavily enriched uranium because it's made from the more common U-238 isotype, which remember is 99% of all uranium. And so everybody wants it. Whether you're making weapons or whether you're making fuel, plutonium is really valuable. This ring is nearly pure plutonium. It's about 11 centimeters across, a bit longer than your index finger. I'll just let you pause and measure that. 11 centimeters, a bit longer than your index finger as a ring. And it weighs about five kilograms. It's shaped like a ring because if it were a ball, just a sphere, there's a risk it would start a chain reaction and blow itself apart. Plutonium is that reactive in a nuclear sense. There are also two main isotopes of plutonium, which we won't go into as much detail. Basically, plutonium-239 on the left is the fissile one, um, and that's the isotope that's really valuable because it's, it has a higher yield than uranium. Plutonium-240 is actually too unstable to be useful. Um, it's prone to what's called spontaneous fission, which, if that happens in a bomb, is called pre-detonation. This tends to blow apart the material before it has a chance to chain react properly and causes a fizzle. Instead, you just shower particles of plutonium everywhere, which is still a, like it's still a bad place to be, but it's not a giant mushroom cloud. So when I talk about the quality of plutonium, I'm referring to the quantity of plutonium-239, the left isotope. There are two main ways to get to plutonium. You take your uranium-238, that's the heavier isotope, bombard it with nucleons, and it does some some physics stuff, it absorbs them, and then it decays, it emits some particles, and decays into plutonium. This happens automatically when you're using enriched uranium. You know, if you've got a nuclear reactor, you've got some fuel in there, 5% U-235, 95% U-238, you've got neutrons showering all over the place, some of them are going at the right speed, they're going to make plutonium. So after you've used your fuel, some of it, about 1%, it turns out, is plutonium. So you can extract that and uh, extract that chemically and end up with very high quality plutonium and that is called reprocessing. You can also, one moment sorry, I'm waiting for a sneeze here, uh, you can also breed U-238 on purpose. Um, that's when you build a special reactor to give plutonium, uh, sorry, give uranium the right conditions to become plutonium. Um, that kind of reactor doesn't produce any electricity. You know, it, it's not useful in a civilian sense because it leads to high quality plutonium. Um, and <clears throat> that can be, that can produce weapons grade plutonium, which is 93% of that 239 isotype. Okay. So, Uranium, plutonium, plutonium, uranium. They're both useful in weapons and they're both useful in fuels for electricity. Now let's go back to centrifuges. They're very fast spinning devices. Uh, they're used to separate gases. Their cousin liquid centrifuge is useful for separating fluids, often blood. Gas centrifuges are mostly used for separating uranium isotopes. They were proposed during the Manhattan Project um, you know, early 1940s, but couldn't be made practical in time. They were later invented and refined by Pakistan. I mean, invented, you know, inspired, whatever, by Pakistan around 1980 for uranium enrichment. And then almost immediately that technology made its, its way elsewhere in the world. 
If you've ever seen those old spy films about people passing around briefcases full of nuclear secrets, fighting over them and jumping off the rooftops, some of those briefcases would have contained centrifuge technology, the secrets of building, maintaining and using these centrifuges for uh, to enrich uranium as part of a nuclear program. Again, this is also uh, this is a fairly simplified perspective on the whole thing, but that's what we've got. About. So nuclear enrichment facilities have huge rooms of these spinning away. They're between two to five meters high. They spin at about 50,000 RPM and they're lined up in cascades. The output of one goes and becomes the input of the next. So what did Stuxnet do to interfere with them? They, uh, Stuxnet compromised the PLCs um, controlling these centrifuges and changed their operation. That's another acronym I can never remember. Programmable logic controllers. Kind of a field gate array kind of thing. Um, caused them to spin at subtly wrong speeds. You know, instead of 50,000 like they should, they'd maybe go down to 40,000 and then speed up to 60,000 and back down. And because these are incredibly precise and rel relatively delicate machines, that was enough to do damage. And the result was that about one in five of them was broken or damaged and had to be replaced. Now, because they function in cascades, that is enough. If you've got five centrifuges spinning away happily, and then one of them it breaks down because Stuxnet got it and has to be um, altered, then that's in, going to interfere with the process of the rest. And Stuxnet has successfully interfered with, your, with that cascade. Remember that big diagram I showed you at the start? We are going to work up to that now. So to start with, you've got your uranium. You mine that out of the ground, as with any other metal. You get your ore, and then you smelt that down and refine it to pure uranium. But uranium is a metal, I showed you before, and we're talking about gas centrifuges. Getting a metal to be a gas is really, really difficult. You've got to heat it incredibly high. But it turns out that if you add fluorine to uranium, you get uh, uranium hexafluorine, which is much more easily expressed as a gas. And then you can put that into the centrifuge. Um, Matt, can we have the uh, can review, please? Well, thank you. Hello. So, um, how does this work? <laughs> so um, I've had to mentally adjust some of these parts to, to the online format. Um, so centrifuges, recall that the uranium that goes in is about 99% of the U238 isotope and about 0.7% of the 235 isotope. Now, because they're slightly different weights, the U238 is heavier. It's only about a 1% difference, but that's enough. So what you do is you take your gas and you push it into your centrifuge and you get a great big cylinder. There we go. And you spin that really quickly. And because of centrifugal force, what happens here is that the heavier isotope gets flung to the outside of the centrifuge and the lighter isotope stays more towards the middle. And so you can suction out that lighter isotope from the center and that is slightly enriched. It's got a higher proportion of the U235. Can we switch views back, please? Thanks. And then you go back and do, you take the output there and pass it into the input of the next centrifuge and you do the same thing. You spin it really quickly, the heavier isotope gets pushed to the outside, the lighter isotope stays in the middle. You pull that out and you've got slightly more enriched uranium. And then you just keep going with that and you repeat and you repeat and you repeat. And over time, you get more and more enriched uranium. It's a very partial effect. So you do need to repeat it a whole bunch of times. Uh, but the result is that you have these two streams. You've got your enriched uh, stream of uranium going down the left, passing between centrifuges, but you've also got what's called depleted uranium um, down the right. And depleted uranium is just the opposite of enriched. You know, it's got a lower proportion of U235, and a higher proportion of U238. So here we come back to this. Starting at the top, you take your pure uranium and you pass it into a centrifuge. With those centrifuges, you spin them and you produce your two streams, your depleted uranium and your enriched uranium. Follow the stream on the right, 
through the enriched uranium, that can be taken straight away and turned into an atomic bomb, such as the one dropped on Hiroshima, the smaller one that we saw at the start. You can also use it as fuel in a reactor um, to produce electricity. You know, that's very useful, that's very civilian. And once you've done that, the spent fuel, remember, some of it is now plutonium, about 1%, because it was treated, the, it contained U238, which was treated just right, and it turned into plutonium. So you can extract that, um, called reprocessing, and you've got plutonium. Now go back to the top, the pure uranium. Oh, you know what, I am going to try the uh, annotate controls here. I see how this goes. <sighs> no, it'll mess with the uh, animations. So with your depleted uranium, that is less useful, but you can take that straight away and you can turn it into armor for tanks, or you can turn the heavy shells for artillery. And because it's so dense, that actually makes it pretty useful. It is still reasonably radi radioactive, but uh, that seems to be considered acceptable. And it's okay to go to someone else's country and bombard them with uranium and leave, you know, a couple of tons lying around the battlefield. Just gently emitting radiation. That aside, with your depleted uranium, you can also breed it, put it into that specially made breeder reactor, which doesn't produce power, which is quite expensive, but produces very high quality plutonium. And we have arrived back at this skin. I just realized I probably have a cursor. No, I don't. Fine. Um, and with that plutonium, you can use that to make hydrogen bombs, fission fusion weapons, such as the big one I showed before. And you can also use it to make reactor fuel. Um, plutonium-based reactor fuel for more electricity. Now, what Stuxnet did with this is it went after the centrifuges. And if we just look at the whole supply chain here, then interfering with the centrifuges means you're unable to enrich uranium. You're un unable to separate the depleted uranium from the higher quality stuff, which means you can't do that. Now, without enriched uranium, you aren't able to make atomic bombs or reactor fuel. And if you can't use, uh, put it into your reactor, you can't turn that into spent fuel and you can't extract plutonium from the result. Without depleted uranium, you also can't make these munitions. But more importantly, you can't feed a breeder reactor. So you can't get plutonium that way either. So your access to plutonium is cut off. And without that, you can't make the fission fusion hydrogen bombs and you can't make reactor fuel that way. So by interfering with the enrichment process, by interfering with the centrifuges, Stuxnet was able to damage Iran's access to these nuclear materials. Right, that's the uh, big scary flowchart out of the way and we're coming towards the end here. Um, questions in chat will be welcome. I've just got a couple more things to talk about first. So here's the thing. Nuclear treaties exist um, because countries who are nuclear capable, that is to say, they have the big bombs, it's a very exclusive club and they don't want more people joining them, with some exceptions. So there are treaties in place to, designed to allow countries to pursue nuclear energy. Um, you know, take uranium, turn to electricity, power your homes, power your factories, you know, that's all above board, that's fine but without enabling this production of weapons. When people talk about weapons-grade uranium or weapons-grade plutonium, they're talking about, remember that table before, um, enriched uranium that is not only useful as a fuel, but also in bombs. And they're talking about plutonium, which has been bred so that it is of high enough quality that it can also be used in weapons. So um, Iran has had some rocky relations with a fair number of countries in the world or other countries have had rocky relations with them you know not going into that but um they've been trying to pursue a nuclear program a civilian nuclear program for power and one must imagine that whoever built stuxnet and whoever deployed stuxnet at the cost of four zero days in windows and, and presumably a whole bunch of talented development time and testing time Whoever did that was probably trying to interfere with their weapons program, which I'm not completely sure about the claims here, so don't quote me on them. But 
perhaps they weren't supposed to have a weapons program or perhaps that they were supposed by the treaties not to have as much of a weapons program as the author of Stuxnet did. You know, just kind of speculating here. But that's the thing. Treaties exist, but they are of limited impact. So maybe someone thought Iran was cheating. That's what Stuxnet was intended to do. Disrupt the nuclear supply chain. Disrupt potential weapons programs by damaging or destroying centrifuges. Thank you. Here's the credit slide. Won't dwell on that for too long. You're welcome to freeze frame and come back to it later if you want to know how, for example, those maps came to be. The, um, the simulation is a nuke map. It's really amazing. So maybe check that out. Apart from that, that's me. That's the talk. Thanks so much. And I'll now be taking questions on somewhat of a delay, I'm afraid. Absolutely. Hello again. Cool. Um, so Madhav asked, has any malware similar to Stuxnet in terms of the number of zero days vulnerabilities ever been used since? Not that I know of. I'm not exactly au okay fait with geopolitics and you know nation state level attacks. Um, we, uh, I'm, I'm just going by work now. We do see fairly often malware using one, maybe two, maybe even three vulnerabilities at once, but they're usually not zero days. Um, you know, for example, the Citrix Netscaler, aka ADC, um, vulnerabilities from late December last year, that was a single vuln that was gleefully exploited. Um, it had been announced, but there hadn't been a patch made available for it. And so everyone just ran around, and, um, you know, script kiddies deployed that as much as possible. But, uh, Sorry, to answer that directly, it might be worth you looking into it. Okay, Aiden said, how can an RBMK reactor explode? Simple answer, I have no idea. What is an RBMK reactor? I'm fascinated by the stuff and I love to talk about it, but I'm still kind of a hobbyist. And frankly, um, you might have noticed on the credit slide, there was a book titled Nuclear Physics for Dummies. So yeah, um, my knowledge in this domain is very specific to what was Stuxnet up to? <laughs> Maybe a Chernobyl or a Fukushima thing? I don't know. Are there any more questions in chat? Not at the moment. All right, we'll hold tight for a moment and then I think if there's nothing more to come up, I might end the stream. Now I, I am a massive nerd about the stuff and I love to talk about it. So um, if you want to find me afterwards um, then and chat about it in Slack, then you'd be very welcome to. I'd love to talk. Ah, thanks, Jacob. Hey, it's the disappearing mug. All ah, right, OK, cool. They thought RBMK reactors couldn't explode. Mr. Distracto says, hi, David. Thanks for the talk. I vaguely recall hearing something about Windows not being allowed for use in nuclear power plants anymore, perhaps because of the Stuxnet attack. I'm not aware of that either, I'm afraid. Is, it, is that true, or have I misremembered? Um, it's plausible, but the thing is, if you want to switch out Windows, then you need to switch in something else. And that something else will probably also come with its own fair share of vulnerabilities. You know, I, I'm not personally a Windows user myself, and there are all the jokes about Windows being so insecure and so widely deployed everywhere. You see ACMs running Windows Embedded Edition and all that jazz, but at the end of the day, it's a very widely used operating system with a vendor with lots of money, lots of resources, and lots of motivation to make, make it good or make it safe. So um, I could see that being the case, but I could also see whatever they put in um, potentially being an issue too. Like, do you switch to like a custom Linux distribution? Do you start developing something from scratch? In which case, you're going to probably make a whole bunch of mistakes that Microsoft has already made in the distant past with, with their own kernel, all that sort of thing. So, don't know, sorry. But it could go either way. Joker said, wasn't one of the super interesting parts of how Stuxnet was spread. 
Are you thinking of how it went through a lot of the world and was distributed in many, many places and was extremely stealthy until it detected um, that it was running on a machine which had the particular uh, vendor's software which was related to centrifuges? So, you know, a lot of computers worldwide were infected but didn't know it and showed no symptoms. Um, and there was something about air gaps, uh, someone bringing in a flash drive to the facility potentially that they weren't supposed to, or a contractor connecting their machine. What's that effect? Um, or are you thinking of something else entirely? Can I have a hint, please? No other questions right now, so I'll just sit back and wait for that to uh, make it out. Hey, we can all be on YouTube. Check it out. Ooh, that's not playing well with the green screen. <laughs> If um, <clears throat> that might be coming to an end, I'm not sure. That's right, yeah. Um, yeah, basically, I think that's the main use of the zero days, right? To get it onto the SCADA device over the air gap. Yep. James Burns, Dibbles, how did they bridge the air gap into the plant? I don't know about that, actually. Um, I mean, I, I can speculate about the common causes of malware making it into places that it shouldn't. Um, but I don't know specifically if, if you have any answers and you're asking questions because you want to hear the answers, um, please just share the answers. But this was 10 years ago. Uh, I was still in uni or not even at uni yet at the time. Um, definitely wasn't working inside of security. So my background knowledge of this is kind of what you saw on the news as a teenager, you know? James said, is the way the final hop occurred known or nah? Nah. I, Jake has said, it copies itself onto USB devices. This is a really awkward format for having a back and forth conversation. I'm sorry. Yeah, USB. Not too many of those. That's neat. Fewer than there used to be, too. Uh, that's the malware aspect. Um, anything on the physics or the supply chain side? We'd be happy to delve into that some more. Jacob says they also had a follow on called Flame. Just realized I can type in here too. Logan said, where were they getting the bulk of their uranium from? Lovely question. Uh, I honestly don't know. You could probably look into the treaties that applied at the time and see if there were restrictions. Um, there tends to be a lot of supervision around this stuff, you know, who is permitted to sell to whom and inspectors to ensure this is the case. Um, the photo that I showed before inside the facility back in 2008 with the, um, the uranium blokes walking through the centrifuges, that was part of a... I want to say World Health Organization, but it's not. Similar kind of org inspection and show off procedure. Don't know that either. Could probably do a quick Google. Um, oh yeah, it would be worth mentioning though that Australia has been one of the world's major suppliers of uranium for a long time. So who knows, could have come from here. We're not here specifically, Southeast Queensland, just coal and vegetables. <clears throat> uh, 
In that case, I think we might bring this to a close. I'll just keep one eye on the uh, on the stream at the same time. That might bring it to a close. All right. Um, hello, sir. I'm back on. Everyone can hear me now. <laughs> Hi. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, once again, we owe you a mug. Um, but I can see you already have a mug, but hey. we do owe you a mug. We'll get that to you soon. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for the talk. Um, our next talk is on Thursday night. Um, Bray Webb will be doing a talk about Graal, which is one program multiple languages on Thursday night at 5 p.m. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming tonight and we hope to see you there. Yeah. See ya. Thanks so much for coming along. Thank you. Chat some other time.